Hey everyone, in today's video we have yet another Pioneer SX 737 stereo receiver. This thing showed up locally from the original owner. He told me he remembers listening to this thing in his younger days and just thinking about the world and one day a very long time ago, I think he said 30 years ago, it just stopped working. It made a lot of really bad noises and it's just been shelved ever since and he wants it to work again. So that's why it's here. So we're going to take a quick look at this thing, we're going to diagnose it, and uh, we'll get it up and running hopefully in this video. Alright, let's go. So like I said, we've got yet another one of these. This is the third one of these that's been on my bench this year. So if we look here, we've got, you know, the typical fading of the FM muting off and mono uh, graphic there. But all the switches on this feel really good. Uh, tuning thing works, volume feels good. All these controls feel pretty good. Um, what the owner described to me seems characteristic of what we've talked about plenty of times on this channel, which is 2SC 1451 and 2SA 726 transistors failing in the power amplifier board. So I don't know when the last time this thing was turned on is, but we're going to do that right now on the dim bulb and we're going to see what the heck happens when you turn it on. So we've got one homemade repair here. Um, we'll get this repaired uh, the proper way whether that's replacement of the power cord or just proper soldering and heat shrinking of these uh, leads right here but as far as I can tell this is safe enough for the dim bulb so the dim bulb tester is off we will bring power to this thing and uh, let's turn it on okay very good and we have a relay click which is also very good we are currently on FM if I turn the dial, I get activity from the tuning meter, which is always a good thing. Mono's turned off. And if I tune to a station, I get the stereo light. So, that's good. So far, the only light that's burnt out is the FM light. So, AM light works. Phono, mic, and aux lights work also. So, only one burnt out bulb. Not bad. Um, since we have relay click, that's a good thing. That means there's nothing too bad coming out of the uh, power amplifier board. So let's take a minute and uh, get our multimeter out and see what's actually happening back there. We'll set it to DC volts and I'll come around here. Can you see that? You sure can. And uh, we've got the A speakers turned on. I'll turn on B just for convenience. Now check the right channel. Basically no DC offset. Very interesting. So, so far quite healthy. Oh, did you hear that folks? What's going on right now is the, uh, the relay clicked completely on its own without anything happening. So that tells me right away something is very wrong with the uh, power amplifier board. And maybe the reason I wasn't seeing any DC offset was that it already unclicked or clicked itself out. And I did not see any reading. I'm just going to do immediately what I know needs to be done, which is replace those six transistors in the power amplifier board. I'm going to do that right now. I'm not going to do any further testing without getting those replaced and setting the bias and going from there. Because... There's a reason these things keep showing up. These things have bad transistors in here. You gotta get them out of there. You gotta replace them with the right stuff and you gotta set your bias and DC offset when you're done. So, we're gonna do that right now. That's how often this happens, folks. That's how I'm able to just do that without even looking at a service manual. Like, this happens to every single one of them. They behave the same way. It's the same parts that fail. It's just, it's just that common. So now we actually have to test this just to make sure I'm not eating my words because uh, that'd be kind of funny if it worked even worse after I supposedly fixed it. So, all right, let's go. All right, let's do it again. There we go. No relay click. No 
going to do some work off camera because I got way too confident going in here thinking it was just these transistors because clearly it is not. So I'll be back and I'll tell you what I figure out. I'm thinking something on the protection circuit is out of whack. So let's go underneath and take a look at the uh, protection circuit. The protection circuit is this board right here. As you can see, we got plenty of pins on here. And, uh, well, something on here might be out of whack. So here's a fun one. What we've got here is a DC power supply. I've got it set to 24 volts, as you can see on the multimeter, because that is the voltage we need to um, activate the coil on this relay. So if I just take this and put it on the other end here, if you listen, Our relay is working just fine when it's given what it needs. So that kind of uh, gets that out of the picture. The coil is just fine. We need to understand why the protection circuit is not giving it the voltage it needs. You know, I keep forgetting I have this laptop. I was walking over to my desktop and coming back and checking voltages, but uh, this is a lot easier. So. I will put the schematic on the screen because I know you can't read this. I have a theory. Um, so if we take a look at the relay over on the right side of the schematic, uh, pins 10 and 9 have the exact same voltages. So that means that the relay is not getting ground. There's voltage there. It's ready to go. It's ready to uh, uh, get the relay to work, but it's not getting ground. And the way it gets ground is Q7. A transistor is basically a switch. Q7 is waiting for a command to switch that uh, ground on so we can get a ground from uh, Q7 it probably goes through uh, our what is that 28 that 220 ohm resistor right below Q7. That's probably how it's gonna get ground but if we look at the voltages on Q7 they're basically zero at uh, the base and the emitter. Obviously zero at the emitter because it's not getting a signal to allow the relay to ground out. So if we go all the way back to Q6, we take a look at those voltages and we see that they are a little funky still, particularly at the base. We're supposed to see negative one volt at the base and we don't. That's strange. So if we go even further back, we take a look at Q5, which is a 2SA733. None of those voltages are right, but most notably, at the collector of Q5, it is positive 0.7 volts. So that's a big red flag for me. When I see a voltage that's an inverted polarity compared to what it's supposed to be, I know something very wrong is going on. If I go even further back in the schematic, I noticed that at the base of Q5, we're supposed to have like a 20 volts coming off of both collectors on Q1 and Q2. We're getting about 5 or 7 volts over there, so that's um, a problem for me. Maybe Q1 and Q2 are the issue. Maybe those two need to have uh, replacements installed and uh, Maybe that will get our 20 volts back and uh, we can see what's going on there. I think I figured it out, folks. It was a bit of a journey getting here, but I uh, basically followed it all the way back from uh, Q7. So I tested Q7, Q6, and Q5 in the schematic, and uh, they all tested okay. But then I noticed the 20 volts it was talking about at the uh, collectors of Q1 and Q2. There was some erratic stuff going on at Q1. So when I removed Q1, I got the 20 volts back at the uh, collector at uh, D5 cathode. We've got the 20 volts again. With the absence of Q1, this thing works perfectly. So basically the state this is in right now is the right channel is protected, but if something were to happen in the left channel, this would not be able to sense it. 
I just need to find a replacement for this, which is a 2SC869. I've never replaced one of those before. Okay, Mark the Fixer says KSC1845 for this circuit, so let's see. There it is. We're done. Not really, but we have a uh, supposedly functioning stereo receiver now. See if we can get good sound out of this receiver. So, it's working, um, but we're definitely getting weird stuff out of the preamplifier. So sometimes when you've got erratic behavior out of the uh, preamplifier, it can mean that there's simply really dirty controls. So since these controls are so dirty, what I'm about to do is I'm just going to clean them just so I know that everything around here is working as it should and I'm not getting uh, taken down any uh, misleading roads, if you will. Let's queue up the time lapse and uh, watch me clean these controls. Okay, now that all the controls are cleaned with our nice deoxid products here, uh, fader F5 on the pots and D5 on the switches, I'll turn this back on and we will see what the heck is going on. Do we still have relay? We sure do. Alright, sorry I didn't record like any of the actual work being done here, I'm in a bit of a hurry to get this done, but I can show you right now. This is the uh, preamplifier board on the SX737. You can see I've replaced all of the capacitors and all of the uh, transistors. This had uh, 2SA726s on it in the first two, and then 2SC1344s, which in the forums are both known to be uh, kind of nasty, and I personally have seen uh, the, at least the 726's go bad so very glad those are out of here so this is one of the easier boards to work on it just comes out there's five screws right here I'll put this right back so this is the last board I'm doing work on I've totally rebuilt the funnel preamplifier board over here which you've seen me do in a previous video this one had the uh, same issues as the other one didn't have a literally leaking electrolytic capacitor, but it might as well have. Let's check out our radio. Card for Amazon, another brand. Did you hear that, folks? The Phono preamplifier also needs to be rebuilt because that was uh, just like that first video I had earlier in the year where the Phono preamp was uh, totally going haywire, so that's no good. I just bought a new capacitor tester. I got the Peak Atlas, what do they call it? The ESR 70 Plus. So this thing's pretty cool. It uh, measures capacitors, gives you a capacitance reading and an ESR reading. I used it on the filter capacitors on this receiver, and they are good. And I used it on just about all the other capacitors I took out, just because I've never had a capacitor tester like this before. And I was curious to see which capacitors were actually bad, if any. And uh, kind of to my surprise, but not too much, almost all the capacitors tested fine. So you might hear me say that and think, oh, recapping is a hoax. Recapping is just a audio foolery BS thing that uh, doesn't mean anything. And uh, yeah, it might, but at the end of the day, 
Are you really going to go through and test every single capacitor and make sure that it is uh, in spec? I mean, you got to take it out to do that and if you're going to take it out you might as well replace it because it's 50 years old even if it is okay. I mean for these filter capacitors maybe leave them there because they're expensive but you know look at this bag of stuff here like you really want all these in your receiver? I don't. So I replace them. Because I think it's just simply the right thing to do. But yeah, these two guys right here, these are the ones that were leaking in that previous video. These capacitors on the tester tested at less than half of their specified value. So they had taken a massive beating or suffered quite a bit. So the protection circuit is right here. I think it was this transistor that uh, was giving us the issues earlier in the video. I replaced the uh, complement to it because there's one of these for each channel. And then I replaced all of the uh, capacitors. So this is going to be a good working protection circuit now. There's a closer look at the phono preamplifier board. I used uh, some film capacitors there and then uh, electrolytics. The tuner board on this receiver was left completely alone because this tuner actually works exceptionally well. It is pulling stations in strongly with no antenna. It uh, seems to be aligned very well. No funky stuff going on there. The only thing it had was a dirty uh, tuner capacitor so I cleaned that with uh, no residue contact cleaner and uh, that sounds a lot better now. No more uh, scratchiness. And then a uh, power amplifier board again. We've all seen that video. Replace your 2SC 1451's and 2SA 726's new diff pair and bias transistors. So that's been taken care of. Power supply. This is where it was interesting. I replaced all the electrolytic capacitors but you know what's funny? When I hooked each one of these old ones up to my tester they all tested just fine. There was nothing wrong with any of them. They were all good. And I don't have one of these uh, 1000 microfarad guys on hand right now. But this thing tested great. It's got a really low ESR and uh, the capacitance value is right on the money. And then to put the icing on the cake, every single lamp in this receiver has been replaced with a brand new incandescent bulb from dgwojo.com. So, if you need lamps, go there. Um, you've seen my relamp video that I did on a SX535. Um, go to there if you want to see uh, how you do that. Uh, the only difference with this one is you've got the indicator lamps. You gotta remove this piece right here. Then there's a bunch of wires under there. You gotta splice each wire together to replace the uh, bulb, so that's at least one way to do it. Alright, let's try it out. No dim bulb, here we go. FM. Click. And it works. And of course, we need everyone's favorite song. Are you ready? good to me. And obviously this thing looks great too with these brand new lights. Always nice to see a freshly lit incandescent uh, bulb receiver. So I'll put the cover back on and uh, this one's done. But yeah let me know if you have any particular questions about this refresh. Uh, thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one.